when you say space time is doomed, is it the space? Is the is the is it the time? Is it the very hard coded specification of four dimensions? Uh, or are you specifically referring to the kind of uh, perceptual domain that humans operate in, which is space time? You think like there's a three D, um, like the, our world is three dimensional and time progresses forward, therefore three dimensions plus one, four D. What, uh, what, what exactly do you mean by space time? What, what, what do you mean by space time is doomed? Great, great. So this is, by the way, not my quote. This is from, for example, Nima Arkani Hamed at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Ed Witten, also there. David Gross, Nobel Prize winner. So this is not just something the cognitive scientists, this is what the physicists are saying. Yeah, the physicists are space time, uh, Skeptics. Yeah, they're saying <laughs> that, and I can say exactly why they think it's doomed, but what they're saying is that, because you know, your question was, what, what aspect of space-time, what are we talking about here? It's both space and time, their union into space-time as in Einstein's theory. That's doomed. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're basically saying that uh, even quantum theory, uh, this is with Neymar, Connie, Hamed especially. So th th Hilbert spaces, will not be fundamental either. So that that the notion of Hilbert space, which is really critical to quantum field theory, quantum information theory, uh, that's not going to figure in the fundamental new laws of physics. So what they're looking for is some new mathematical structures beyond space-time, beyond you know, Einstein's four-dimensional space-time or supersymmetric version, you know, geometric algebra signature two comma four kind of, uh, there are different ways that you can represent it, but they're finding new structures. And, and, and by the way, they're succeeding now. They're finding, they found something called the amplitudehedron. This is Nima and his colleagues, the, the cosmological polytope. These are, so the, there are these like polytopes, these polyhedra in, in multi dimensions, generalizations of simplices that are coding for, for example, the scattering amplitudes of, of processes in the Large Hadron Collider and other, other colliders. So they're finding that if they let go of space-time completely, they're finding new ways of computing these scattering amplitudes that turn literally billions of terms into one term. When you do it in space and time, because it's the wrong framework, it's, it's, it's just a user interface, from, that's now from the evolutionary point of view, it's just user interface, it's not a deep insight into the nature of reality. So it's missing deep symmetry, something called a dual conformal symmetry, which turns out to be true of the scattering data, but you can't see it in space-time. And it's making the, comp the computations way too complicated because you're trying to compute all the loops and Feynman diagrams and all the Feynman integrals. So see, the Feynman approach to the scattering amplitudes is trying to enforce two critical properties of space-time locality and unitarity. And so by when you enforce those, you get all these loops and multiple, you know, different levels of loops. And for each of those, you have to add new terms to your computation. But when you do it outside of space-time, you don't have the notion of unitarity. You don't have the notion of locality. You have something deeper and it's capturing some symmetries that are actually true of the data. And But then when you look at the geometry of the facets of these polytopes, then certain of them will code for unitarity and uh, locality. So it actually comes out of the structure of these deep polytopes. So what we're finding is there's this whole new world, now beyond space-time, that is making explicit symmetries that are true of the data that cannot be seen in space-time, and that is turning the computations from billions of terms to one or two or a handful of terms. So we're getting insights into symmetries, and, we're, and all of a sudden, the math is becoming simple because we're not doing something silly. We're not adding up all these loops in space-time. We're doing something far deeper. But they don't know what this world is about. All, so, you know, they're in an interesting position where we know that space-time is doomed. And I, I should probably tell you why it's doomed, what they're saying about why it's doomed. But, but they need a flashlight to look beyond space-time. What, what flashlight are we going to use to look into the dark beyond space-time? Because Einstein's theory and quantum theory can't tell us what's beyond them. All they can do is tell us that when you put us together, space-time is doomed at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Beyond that, space-time doesn't even make sense. It just has no operational definition. So, but it doesn't tell you what's beyond. And so they're, they're just looking for deep structures, like guessing. It's really fun. So these really brilliant guys at 
generic, brilliant men and women who are doing this work, mm. uh, physicists, are making guesses about these structures, informed guesses, because they're trying to ask, well, okay, what deeper structure could give us the stuff that we're seeing in space-time, but without certain commitments that we have to make in space-time, like locality. So they make these brilliant guesses, and of course, most of the time you're gonna be wrong. But once you get one or two that start to pay off, and then you get some lucky breaks. So they got a lucky break back in 1986. Um, a couple of mathematicians named Park and Taylor took the scattering amplitude for two gluons coming in at high energy and four gluons going out at low energy. So that kind of scattering thing. So, so like apparently for people in, who are into this, that's sort of something that happens so often you need to be able to find it and get rid of those because you already know about that and you need to. So you needed to compute them. It was billions of terms. And they couldn't do it, even for the supercomputers couldn't do that for the many billions or millions of times per second they needed to do it. So they they begged, you know, the experimentalists begged the theorists, please, can you, you got it. And so Park and Taylor took the billions of terms, hundreds of pages, and mirac miraculously turned it into nine. And then a little bit later, they guessed one term expression that turned out to be equivalent. So billions of terms reduced to one term, that so-called famous Park-Taylor formula, 1986. And that was like, okay, where did that come from? What This is a pointer into a deep realm beyond space and time, but, but no one, I mean, what can you do with it? And they thought maybe it was a one-off, but then other formulas started coming up. And then eventually, Nimar Khani Hamad and his team found this thing called the amplitudehedron, which really sort of captures the whole, a, a big part of the whole ball of wax. Um, I'm sure they would say, no, there's plenty more to do. So, so I won't say they did it all by any means. They're looking at the cosmological polytope as well. So what's remarkable to me is that two pillars of modern science, quantum field theory with gravity on the one hand and evolution by natural selection on the other, just in the last 20 years have very clearly said space-time has had a good run. Reductionism has been a fantastic methodology. So we had a great ontology of space-time, a great methodology of reductionism. Now it's time for a new trick. <laughs> but now you need to go deeper and, and show, but by the way, this is, doesn't mean we throw away everything we've done, not by a long shot. Every new idea that we come up with beyond space-time must project precisely into space-time and it better give us back everything that we know and love in space-time or generalizations or it's not gonna be taken seriously, and it shouldn't be. So, so we have a strong constraint on whatever we're going to do beyond space-time. It needs to project into space-time. And whatever this deeper theory is, it may not itself have evolution by natural selection. This may not be part of this deeper realm. But when we take the whatever that thing is beyond space-time and project it into space-time, it has to look like evolution by natural selection, or it's wrong. So, so that's so that's a strong constraint on on this work. So even the evolution by natural selection and uh, quantum field theory are, could be interfaces into something that n that doesn't look anything like, like you mentioned. I mean, it's interesting to think that evolution might be a very crappy interface into something much deeper. That's right. They're both telling us that the framework that you've had can only go so far and it has to stop, and there's something beyond. And that framework, the, the very framework that is, is space and time itself. Now, of course, evolution by natural selection is not telling us uh, about like Einstein's relativistic space time. So that was another question you asked a little bit earlier. It's telling us more about our perceptual space and time, which um, we have used as the basis for creating first a Newtonian space versus time, as a mathem mathematical extension of our perceptions. And then Einstein then took that and, and extended it even further. So the relationship between what evolution is telling us and what the physicists are telling us is that in some sense, the Newton and Einstein space-time are formulated as sort of rigorous extensions of our perceptual space, um, making it mathematically rigorous and, and laying out the symmetries that, that, that they find there. So that's sort of the relationship between them. So it's the perceptual space-time that evolution is telling us is just a, a user interface, effectively. And then the physicists are finding that even the mathematical extension of that into the Einsteinian formulation has to be as well, um, not the final story, there's something deeper.